Guys, welcome to another video. You've got Mr. Everything English and this is going to be a big one. It has been on my mind for a long time because I know you guys need the help and I was thinking of the best way to do it. Now, exams are in three or four days time. I could either have released a video per poem, but I thought, you know what? Forget the views. Let's just put everything in one big video and you guys can make it work. Guys, a few things. Number one. In this video, we're going to cover every single power and conflict poem. Normally, when I make a video on the poems, I normally average about 30 minutes per poem. Now, guys, obviously, it's not going to be 30 minutes per poem because 30 times 15 is about 450 minutes, I believe. That's a heck of a long time. So I'm going to try to guys <coughs> go through each poem in about 10 minutes each. But I promise you guys, you will get everything you need in those 10 minutes. That is a must. Otherwise, this video is an absolute waste of time and that is not something that I like to do. So, I will give you everything you need, guys, when it comes to all 15 poems. Number two, can somebody please, at some point, put timestamps on this video so everyone knows what time is which poem? So, for example, if you just want to jump in and do Ozymandias or Tissues or Prelude, you can jump in and do that particular poem. And guys, number three, before we jump into the poems, this part of the video is the setup. You guys need to know why are we even going through the poems and how does this link to your exam? Now guys, I'm going to be as fast as possible. English literature paper two is a two hours and 15 minute exam, but the power and conflict section is a 45 minute slot in these two hours and 15 minutes. Now, how, the, how does the exam work? For the power and conflict section, you get one question in your exam. And this question is marked out of 30. It is a 30 mark question. And it marks you on AO1, it marks you on AO2, and it marks you on AO3. Now, if you're sitting at home, scratching your head, thinking, sir, what's AO1, what's AO2, what's AO3? Then I'm, I'm beginning to wonder what were you doing in your first English literature exam? Because it's the exact same AOs. AO1, guys, I've been over before, guys. AO1 is your point and your task. Now, guys, by the way, just in case you're wondering, sir, why are you going over this? Because this tells us what we have to go over when we go over the poems. We're not going to read the poems just for the fun of it and for a nice feeling. We're gonna read the poems with the exam in mind. We must go over the poems for AO1, AO2 and AO3. Now AO2 guys, as you all should be aware, is looking at the effect of language, which means language devices, structure, which means structural devices and form. Now super duper quickly guys, when it comes to poetry, I want you guys to either talk about Cezora I want you guys to either talk about enjoyment and I want you guys to either talk about what am I doing? Cezora, enjoyment and Volta. And then guys, actually, shall I go over them? Yeah, let me go over them very quickly. Cezora guys, now as I go through the video, these three will become a lot more clearer. But Cezora guys is when there's punctuation throughout a line and not at the end of a line. Enjambment is when the line of poetry carries on to the next line with no punctuation at the end. And Volta is the shift. Volta is the turning point in the poem. Now, when it comes to structural devices, of course, we can talk about foreshadowing, flashback, zooming in, zooming out. However, for those of us aiming for the top band, you want to make your writing subject specific. So this is English, but this is poetry within English. So these devices, we want to show off to the examiner. But guess what? While every other kid talks about foreshadowing and flashback, you know me, I've done my work. I've done Cezora, I've learned enjoyment, and I've learned Volta, guys, because it shows that you know poetry specific devices. Now, guys, when it comes to form, do you remember when it came to the form of Christmas Carol, we talked about the Gothic genre. When it came to the form of Macbeth and Romeo and Juliet, we spoke about the play and stage directions. Well, out of the 15 poems that we're going to read, we're going to have to categorize them into forms. Now, there's five forms that I care about. I don't care about haikus, guys. I don't care about any other form of poetry because they are wasting our time. We are not in year seven where we are doing fun lessons 
we are in year 11 and we only care about form that we can apply to our exam and those are five there are five forms guys there is the narrative form there is the epic form there is the free verse there is the sonnet and then there is the dramatic monologue now what are these five a narrative form of poetry guys is a poem that tells a story an epic form of poetry is a poem that is about an event for example the charge of the light brigade when we get there this is about an event this is about a battle number three guys let's do sonnet first and then free verse guys the sonnet is a 14 line poem that is normally about love this doesn't have to be romantic love. This can be any form of love. For example, Ozymandias is a sonnet. It is a 14 line poem about love. However, this guy loves power and he loves himself. Three verse guys is a poem that doesn't follow any rules. There's no set stanza length. There's no set line structure. They just go on a mad one. An example of this is checking out me history. And then we have a dramatic monologue. One character, first person, talking the whole way through. An example of this is my last touches. So what does that mean, guys? This means that when we analyze the poetry, we have to find AO2, language, structure, and form. Now, not every single AO2. We're not going to pick out every single language device, every single structural device, every single form device. At this point of the year, I'm going to give you three quotes per poem that you should revise and use in your exam. And those three quotes will have a blend of these uh, devices. Now, when it comes to point and task, this depends oh, point, task, and I forgot, guys, it also looks at reference. It also looks at quotes. Now, this depends upon the question, but what I will give you are your references from each poem, your three quotes from each poem that you should learn for your exam. And guys, finally, A03, and this is our context. And again, when we go over each poem, I will give you context. This is stuff like patriarchy, religion, and so on. Now, what is this question? What is the poetry question in the exam? And why do so many people mess it up? Guys, it is a 45 minute question, right? I recommend planning between anywhere between five and seven minutes. If you can plan faster, fantastic. But try to plan anywhere between five to seven minutes. And your target is right, three paragraphs in this time period. Now, these paragraphs are going to be pretty big paragraphs because the way I do it is I compare the poems in each paragraph. I call it ping pong. We go back and forth, back and forth. Paragraph one, you compare both poems. Paragraph two, you compare both poems. Paragraph three, you compare both poems. A comparison can be a similarity. A comparison can be a difference. It just depends whatever is easier for you on the day of your exam, unless they specify in the question similarity or difference. And that is, guys, the overall structure of your writing. So, guys, do the maths. Three paragraphs in approximately 38 minutes if you spend seven minutes planning. Now, guys, that is the overall structure of the question itself. Now, what we're going to do, guys, is we're going to go over all the 15 poems. And then at the end of the video, depending upon how tired I am, we will go over very quickly the paragraph structure of how to actually write these three paragraphs and hopefully guys by that point this video will have everything you need for power and conflict poems now guys at this point can you please do the following can you please get out the poem and try to have it in front of you so as we work through the 15 you at home alongside work through the 15. So by the end, when I finish the 15th poem, you've done the 15th poem as well and you've analyzed it as well. All right, guys, now we're going to go to the board. We're going to put the projector on and we're going to begin with poem number one. Hey guys, with the poem Ozzy Mandis, I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk, a shattered facade lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and snare of cold command Tell that his sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. And on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, look on my works, you mighty and despair, nothing beside remains. Around the decay of that colossal wreck, balance and bear, the lone and level sand stretched far away. Let me give you guys a quick summary of what this poem is about. 
Guys, Ozymandias was once a ruler, was once a pharaoh, and he had a statue built of himself, and he put it around his empire, around his kingdom, to show off his power. Now, this statue, guys, is now years later, hundreds of years, hundreds of years later, the entire empire of Ozymandias has turned into sand, has turned into nothingness. But what's left is pieces of his statue. It's broken, it's shattered, but there's pieces left. And the point is this, guys, that over time, nature will always defeat man. Don't think you're so powerful. Don't think you're so special. Because no matter who you are, you will one day die. And everything that made you powerful, your empire, and everything you did, nature will over time defeat you. Because nothing lasts forever. That is the poem Ozymandias. Now, let's start, guys, with what is the form of Ozymandias? Now, the form of Ozymandias is indeed a sonnet. But what does Mr. Ozymandias love, guys? I would say two things. I would say Ozymandias loves himself. And I would say he loves the idea of power. And that is the form of the poem. Now, guys, when it comes to structure, when it comes to structure, guys, I would use the Volta. And the Volta that I would use is nothing beside remains. That is a very powerful Volta. Remember, guys, Volta is the shift in the poem. Now, why is that the shift? Because all over here, Ozymandias is literally thinking he's a bad man. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, be mighty and despair. And then bang, nothing beside remains. That is the Volta. That is the turning point. Because by saying nothing remains, it gives the idea that don't think you're so special. And that is done through the Volta. Because your life can shift. Your life can turn in an instance. So that is the form. That is a structural device we can talk about. And there is one quote that you can learn for your exam. If you want to go there, this part over here is also a caesura. Remember guys, a caesura is when there is a pause in the middle of a line, when the writing does not carry on. And all of that, guys, gives emphasis to the idea that nothing beside remains. Next quote, guys, that I would use from this poem is over here. My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. Remember, guys, this is the power and conflict section. That is the section of our exam. Now, this quote over here, number one, it's a hyperbole. Number two, this quote is also quite symbolic. And number three, this quote is also juxtaposition. Now, what are the different ways that we can use this quote? My name is Ozymandias, King of Kings. King of Kings, who is the king? Who is the ultimate king? Is God. Ozymandias, guys, at this point in the play, he is saying that he should be worshipped as though he is the God of Gods. He is the most powerful being alive. And why is it juxtaposition? Because if you look at that and then you look at that, you think, hold on a second, you're a god, but you're literally dead and your statue is battered in the middle of a desert. What kind of god is that? That is why it is juxtaposition. Number two, guys, symbolic. What is the symbolism here? It's the idea of a king. It's the idea of a king. It's as though he is worshipping power. That is, if you guys done Macbeth, it's the same kind of thing. He worships power so much that he wants the title to make himself appear godlike. Um, and hyperbole, guys, is because this guy is over the top. This guy is far too over the top. And then, guys, another quote I would use. Shattered visage lies. A shattered visage lies. I really love this quote, guys. Um, I always talk about the adjective here. The adjective of shattered um, is a very, very good um, word to discuss in this quote. Now, why is the word shattered really good in this quote? If something is broken, it's okay, but it's not that bad. But if something is shattered, it's broken into so many little pieces that it can't be fixed. And this quote, guys, from the offset, it looks at what Ozymandias is in the present day. It goes from the present to the past, back to the present. There are three shifts in this poem. But the, visage, the, the shattered visage it gives the impression of how whatever this guy thought he was, he is beyond repairable. And then from the, from the adjective shattered, you can link it to the power of nature. Nature has done this. No one's come with a hammer and battered the statue. His statue, his empire became sand, became dust, became nothing. 
His statue was destroyed by what? By time. That's it. All that destroyed him was time. Look at all of us who are in this video right now. Guys, as time goes on, I'm going to get old and old and old. And my hair will turn white. And one day I won't be here. Time. Time is defeating us all. And this poem shows you how ultimately, guys, nature and then God is in control. And that is the poem, Ozzy Mandius. The two pieces of context, guys, the two pieces of context that I would use for this poem is Freud and the id and the patriarchy. Why? I would use Freud and the id to talk about how this guy, Mr. Ozzy Mandius, he worships power so much. But look at his outcome. He ultimately challenged God and patriarchy. Again, guys, this dude, he... At the time he was alive, you could argue again, he was a victim of patriarchy because he believed that as a man, he had to be super duper powerful. All right, guys, and there is everything you need for Ozymandias. I do love me the poem London. I wander through each chartered street, near where the chartered Thames does flow and mark in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of war. In every cry of every man, in every infant's cry of fear, in every voice, in every band, the mind forged manacles I hear. What a lovely call. How the chimney sweepers cry, every blackening church appalls, and the hapless soldiers sigh, runs in blood down palace walls. But most through midnight streets I hear how the youthful harlots curse, blast the newborn infant stare, and blight through plague the marriage hearse. The poem, guys, starts with our speaker, Mr. I, whoever the I is. It could be the poet himself, or it could be a made-up character, but we have a first-person poem. This guy is, interestingly, wandering around London. He's walking around and he's looking at London. Now, guys, remember, London is historic. London is the capital of the British Empire. It is a symbol of power. It is a symbol of wealth. It is a symbol of progress. But this guy is wondering and thinking, damn, if this is what this is all about, London has a dark side. London isn't as amazing as we think it is. London has a dark side. What does he see? He sees people that look weak, people that look destroyed. He looks at people that look as though they've been controlled. He looks at children who are suffering through child labor. He looks at young girls who are suffering and who are cursed. He talks about everything wrong with London. And it's the juxtaposition of what we are told London is like, but what he's saying London is actually like. It's the good, but he's saying there's a bad that needs to be talked about a lot more. Now, Guys, the poem, London. Let's start with the form of London. Is it a sonnet? No. Is it a free verse poem? No. I would argue, guys, that a good way of looking at the poem, London, is by talking about how the poem, London, is a narrative poem. And this poem is a narrative poem because it tells the other side of the story when it comes to London. And that is what I would say is the form of our poem. And when it comes to structural devices, the soldier's sigh runs in blood down palace walls. Now here, guys, I will talk about the enjambment. And remember, guys, enjambment is when the line of poetry carries on. It's when the line of poetry continues to the next line. I'll explain why that enjambment is effective in a second. And you can also talk about the use of personification here also. Then, guys, I will talk about another quote, guys, is mind-forged manacles. I'll explain all three quotes in a secularism of manacles <coughs> and the verb of here. And then I will talk about, where am I looking at guys? The third quote that I will talk about is as follows. Marks in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of woe. And for this particular quote guys, I will talk about the repetition. And I would talk about the idea of either the adjective weakness or the adjective woe. You pick which one depending upon your question. All right, guys, what am I doing with these quotes? 
with these three quotes and why have I spoken about them? Um, now guys, when it comes to, guys, when it comes to the first quote, marks in every face I meet, marks of weakness, marks of war. Yes, it's repetition. Yes, it's an adjective. But what are you saying about this particular quote? If you can't remember all of it, use bits of it. But it's the idea that nobody is safe. Everyone in London is controlled. Everyone in London looks as though they are weak. Now, if somebody is weak, somebody must be powerful. Who's in power? Is he referring to the government? Is he referring to institutions? But he is talking about that there's something wrong with London because everyone looks weak and whoa, guys, everyone is suffering. Everyone is struggling in London. Now, next, mind forward mannequins. This is a very, very important quote. You can even talk about the word mind if you want to. Even the word forged, there's so much in that quote. Mind forged means your mind has created. What has your mind created? Your mind has created mannequins. What are mannequins? They are chains. He's saying, what is under control? London, the people of London are not physically controlled. What's being controlled? The brain is being controlled. The mind is being controlled. But the writer is trying to say, look, you can't see this control. Therefore, everyone thinks that they're free. Everyone thinks that life is hunky-dory, but their mind is constantly controlled. Now, the part that he says, I hear them. For me, you can even talk about that as being juxtaposition. He says, I can hear everyone's mannequins. I can hear the fact that everyone is in, in London is controlled. Now, this guy thinks he's safe. This guy thinks he's amazing. And I would argue, is he hearing his own mannequins or is he hearing this? And the point being, he thinks he's free and he thinks everyone else is controlled. But that's exactly what everyone else thinks. Everyone else thinks that they're free and that everyone else is controlled. That's the beauty of controlling somebody's mind. They will never see the shackles. Last quote, guys, last quote, last quote. Hapless soldier, the word hapless can mean many things, but in this context, I think, or I argue, it means useless. And it's the idea that the British Empire, London, was expanding massively, but the people that were sent to war were not capable, were not equipped to fight those wars. So they were useless. And the enjambment is lovely because the enjambment links to the blood that is running down the wall. Just the way the line goes on, the blood is pouring and pouring and pouring. And that's what the enjambment emphasizes. You can then talk about the symbolism of the palace walls and how the palace is talking about the monarchy, the king and the queen. The blood is on their walls. The blood is on their hands. They are responsible. He's attacking the institution of the monarchy. Now guys, if you look at what it spells over here, H E A R hear nobody can hear our cries nobody can hear our screams it's hidden within the text again if you want to you can talk about that now guys that is the poem london the form is a narrative three quotes you should learn are these three quotes i've summarized to you briefly and very quickly what the poem is about now when it comes to context what context would you use a good context i would use guys for this poem Number one is discuss very briefly the role that the British Empire played. This is your historical context. Don't look at this poem as talking about London in 2023. Even though London is pretty much quite similar to this, we're talking about a time where London was seen as the place to be because it was the heart of the British Empire. Right, cool. Ozymandias and London done. Let's move on. Oh boy, we have a big one, guys. We have a big one. All right, shall we read this poem? All right, let's read it, let's read it, let's read it, let's read it. Guys, you know what, this poem, I'm gonna read and go through it as I read it. It will just save us a lot of time. All right, guys, extract from the prelude. One summer evening led by her, who is her? Who is he talking about? The her here, guys, I would argue he is personifying nature. I will talk about how the writer here is personifying nature. Um, led by her, if you wanna learn this quote, you can. But I will talk about how this is personification and the personification is of nature. I found a little boat tied to a willow tree in its usual home. Straight, I unloosed her chain and stepping in, pushed from the shore. So guys, 
the poem begins and essentially the right the writer sorry the speaker has stolen a boat and off he goes it was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure troubled pleasure guys is a good quote to learn it's similar to the quote trampled calmly from um, Jekyll and Hyde because it is an oxymoron now what does this oxymoron represent this, ox this oxymoron guide represents how the speaker knows that what he is doing he should not be doing but he's doing it anyway know that the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on and that this for me is a lovely quote without the voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on it's like the ma it's like nature right he's saying that as i took the boat the mountains around me were echoing what does that mean it's a symbol a symbol of what it's as though nature is cheering him on go on well done well done and the mountains are echoing because the noise is like a stadium. So it's as though nature is cheering him on. Uh, leaving behind a still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon. Until they melted into one track of sparkling light. But now, like one who rose, proud of his skill. Like one who rose, proud of his skill. Guys, he is in the peak of his power. This guy thinks he is amazing. Just when he's on this boat and he is in his element, he is loving it. Life is good. What happened? Huge peak, black, upreared its head. Volta. Guys, this here is the Volta. And the Volta here is the shift. Guys, this here is the shift. Why is it the shift? All that he does over here, guys, yes, he sexualizes the boat into an elfin penis and he talks about how he dips his oars in the lake. Yes, he does all that. We're not going to go over it now because we'll be here for two hours. All we want to talk about over here is this, guys. Here, he steals the boat. Here, he talks about how it's like his adrenaline. He is loving the fact that he's stolen the boat and how amazing it feels being out in the water. But then, here's the Volta. Here is our shift. Everything goes from being happy. Everything goes from being lovely. But then something disturbs him. Something disturbs his, his, his view. Something disturbs what he's doing. A huge peak, black and huge, and comes in the way between the boat, the sky, and then something disturbs his view. Guys, that is a Volta. This is the turning point. This is when everything goes downhill for this uh, particular man. So what do they do, guys? What does he do? It says that this guy, he struck and struck again. Panic 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 and you could talk about the repetition uh, where the panic is emphasized from juxtaposition trembling oars and where is it where is it where is it where is it and i dip my oars you can juxtapose the two quotes in purple if you wanted to look at him at the beginning at the beginning the guy thinks he's having a lovely time he's dipping his his oars into the lake and now his hands are shaking now he's trembling this juxtaposes this uh, and what is he doing guys? He is now trying to go home. So he's trying to run home um, back to the cover of the willow tree. And then if you want to go there again, now he is in a serious mood. He can't get over what he has seen. And the only quote guys that I want you to use from these parts guys is essentially guys, the idea of PTSD. Nothing remain, no pleasant images of sea or sky, no green fields, just huge and mighty forms. Um, this here, guys, can link to our context of PTSD and it can link to the danger of following your desire. I'll go over that in a second. You could talk about how this quote here is a list. Um, and you could talk about how this quote juxtaposes um, the quote at the beginning of our text as to how he viewed nature. Out of all the forms, right, I like to call this poem an epic poem. It's an event, what happens to this man. The event is him getting what he deserves. The event is of nature putting this man in his place. Don't think you're going to abuse your power and get away with it. What is this poem looking at? And guys, by the way, you can learn any of the quotes um, that I've highlighted. Now, what are we saying, guys, this poem is about? This poem, this poem, guys, is in two halves. And the Volta, right there, 
divides the two halves of this poem. Everything before the vulture, this guy is having the time of his life. He is absolutely loving it. Everything after the vulture, this guy is suffering for what he's done in the first part. And this poem, guys, reminds me a lot of Ozymandias. Why? Because it's the idea that don't get carried away, don't abuse power, don't abuse your position, because ultimately nature will put you into its place. So he stole the boat and the boat was his and he was having the time of his life. And as he was having the time of his life, he began to abuse nature. He began to abuse the boat and that's the shift. Nature scared him, nature terrified him. And then he ran home. Whatever he saw caused him so much fear that he ran home and he was mentally disturbed for a long time afterwards. Nothing remained the same. That is the idea of PTSD, where you can't get over what you've seen and you can link it to Freud and the id because this poem shows you the danger of following your desires. All right, that is poem number three complete. Oh God, now we have another big one. And then we move on to my last touches. And guys, this is my favorite poem. I love this poem. And if I was to give you guys a prediction, this is my prediction for this year's exam. I reckon you guys are gonna get my last touches. If you do, fantastic. If you don't, fantastic. All right, guys, my last duchess. What is this poem about? Let's go through it. That's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. Basically, guys, you've got a duke. Actually, let's read it first. Let's read it first. Um, I call that piece of wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hand worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will it please you sit and look at her? I said, Fra Pandolf, by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of his earnest glance. But to myself they turned. Brackets, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you, but I, close brackets, and seemed as they would ask me if they durst, how such a glance came there. So not the first are you to turn and ask thus, sir, twas not her husband's presence only, called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf, perhaps Fra Pandolf, here you go perhaps Fra Pandolf chanced to say her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much, or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought, and cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, it was all one. My favour at her breast, the dropping of the daylight in the west, the bow of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her, the white mule she rode round, with, round the terrace, all and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. She thanked men, good, but thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she wrapped my gift over 900 years old name with anybody's gift. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling, even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such and one, and say, just this or that in you disgust me. Here you miss or there you exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours, forsooth, and made excuse, even then would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt. But, who, when, sorry, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? This grew, I gave command, then all smiles stopped together. And there she stands as if alive. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Though his daughter's self, as I avowed as... Uh, starting is my object blah 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 let's end it there all right guys that is the poem now just because it is a lengthy poem don't be put off guys it's a very good poem <coughs> and i promise you it is written in english now what is this poem about guys the poem is essentially about the duke the duke um is looking to get married again and the guy or the girl he wants to get married to or is looking to get married to, a man from her house has come to see the Duke. And for me, this poem is a warning. The Duke tells this man about his ex-wife, about his previous wife, my last Duchess, my last wife. And we get the impression, guys, that when the poem begins, he says, that's my last Duchess painting on the wall. So he's got a painting of his wife on the wall in his house, his ex-wife. And he says to this guy, look, have a look. 
That's my wife. That's my ex-wife. And then essentially, guys, um, to cut a long story short, he thinks his wife's been having an affair and it seems that he's either got her killed or he killed her himself or something happened to her and she's no longer with us. Um, now, there are a few quotes, guys, that I like to look at. I want you guys to look at this quote here. Since none puts by the curtain, I have drawn for you, but I. And when it comes to this quote, guys, we can analyze the enjoyment and we can talk about how this quote is juxtaposition. Now, what can we say about these two things? What we can say here is as follows. So what the Duke is doing, right, at this point, um, here's the picture of his ex-wife. And in front of the picture, he has a curtain that he lets, he opens for some people to see and he closes for others not to see. But it's like the Duke is a bit weird. He's a bit twisted because he's talking to the picture. That's the brackets. The brackets emphasizes how at that moment, the Duke is directly talking to the picture. He's talking to his wife. What is the Duke doing? He says to the picture, on the wall no one basically can cover you with the curtain or uncover with the curtain but i it's like he thinks he's powerful over her it's like he thinks he's in control but i use this quote to emphasize juxtaposition because even though he thinks he's in control over her the fact that she still plays on his mind shows the opposite it shows that she controls him because he's almost dying for any bit of power over her to the point where he thinks that he has control over her by putting a curtain over and uncovering her picture. That is why it's juxtaposition. And then the enjoyment guys for me here is very powerful. Enjoyment guide, the line carries on, but the line carrying on shows for me her never ending control. Her control still exists, it still carries on. There's not a full stop, there's not a comma, there's not a pause to her control. It is continuous. And that is what I would say to that quote. And it's a nice quote to remember um, for your exam. And then, guys, he basically, at this part of the text, he accuses his wife and he goes through some of the stuff that she got up to. And he's not really happy. <clears throat> he's not really happy, guys, that he wasn't treated special. He impressed, meaning I wasn't special for her. She didn't treat me special, a poor duke. And she liked whatever she looked on and her looks were everywhere. Basically, guys, she was a pervert, according to him. He thinks that his wife was a bit of a pervert. Are women even called perverts? I think so. Um, but yeah, she was a pervert, guys. And he says that her looks went everywhere and she liked what she looked on. She was checking out other men. And then he says it was all one. Now, there's no point remembering all of that. Just that in itself, it was all one. He's basically saying that I wasn't separate. I wasn't special. She treated all of us the same. Who's us? Other men, other people um, that would do things for her. And talk about the idea of a hyperbole. Or if you ever use the entire quote. So you might say from line 23 to 25, you can talk about it as a list um, and how it emphasizes how and what kind of woman she is. Then, guys, I would argue that this entire quote, it goes against the behavior of a patriarchal man. He's, he's like the Romeo and Juliet of poetry. The guy is a wet wipe. Um, he's moping around saying, my wife didn't treat me special. She didn't do things for me. Um, according to him, she was easily impressed. She looked at other people. Fine. That's, if that's what you believe, that's fine. But he kind of goes against patriarchy. He seems insecure. He seems insecure of himself and how his wife felt about him, which juxtaposes the idea of patriarchy. And then, guys, I will link all of this so far to the form of the poem. What is the form of this poem? This poem, guys, is a dramatic monologue. And what is a dramatic monologue, guys? It is a first-person poem, and in this case, it is a very biased poem. Why is it a biased poem? Because we only hear from the Duke's point of view. We don't hear from her point of view. He could be, he could be lying for all we know, but just because it's a dramatic monologue, we must take his word for it because it is a biased, one-sided poem. Stopped.
together and the technique that I would use here is probably the obvious one guys I would use sibilance as my technique Zora in the middle of this line now what would I say about these two things when it comes to the sibilance guys I will talk about how the sibilance gives this poem a very very sinister a very very dark feel um, that is the effect of the S sound being repeated because that is what sibilance is. And when it comes to Cezora, guys, it is an irregular pause. But the irregular pause emphasizes how her life came to a to a to an unplanned pause. She, I reckon she died. And guys, that is the poem. My last touches. I've given you three quotes. I've given you a summary of the poem. You've got the form of a dramatic monologue, and you are good to go for your exam. Next one, guys, Charge of the Light Brigade. I didn't realize how long these poems are. All right, guys, Charge of the Light Brigade. Half a league, half a league, half a league onwards, all in the Valley of Death, rolled the 600. For the Light Brigade, Charge of the Guns, he said, into the Valley of Death, rolled the 600. For the Light Brigade, was there a man dismayed? Not that the soldiers knew someone had blundered. This is not to make reply. This is not to reason why. This is but to do and die. Love the anaphora there. I should be a singer, guys. The value of death rolled the 600. Um, uh, flash the sabers beer. Flash as they turn in air. Sabering the gunners there. Charging an army while all the world wondered. Plunged in the battery smoke. Right through the line they broke. Cossack and Russian reeled from the saber stroke. Shattered and sundered. Then they rolled back, but not the 600. Cannon to the right of them, cannon to the left of them, cannon behind them. Volleyed and thundered, stormed out with shot and shell. While horse and hero fell, they had that, that they that had fought so well came to the jaws of death, back from the mouth of hell. All that was left of them, left of 600. When can their glory fade? Oh, the wild charge they made. All the world wondered, honour the charge they made, honour the light brigade, noble 600. Guys, this poem essentially is about an army and the army was named uh, Light Brigade and it is about how this army charged into battle. However, the context goes that this army misinterpreted or misheard the order. The order that the army received was to back down. But the army, for some strange reason, they misheard the order and they charged and a lot of them were killed and some of them survived. That is what the poem is about. Now, when it comes to this particular poem, guys, straight off the bat, I would like you all to talk about how this poem is an epic poem because it is definitely about an event. It's probably the easiest poem when it comes to, is it about an event? And what event is this about, guys? This is about the charging of the Light Brigade. It is about a war. It is about a battle. And when it comes to this particular poem, guys, and our quote that we want to learn, an easy quote, guys, is the idea of into the valley of death very early on but a very good quote to remember and this quote guys is the idea of foreshadowing and the symbolism that is produced from death and if you take it further guys you can also link it to some context and the idea of propaganda now, how can we talk and what can we say about these three things? I will discuss it in a second. Um, then a good, lovely set of lines to talk about is these three lines over here. This is not to reason. This is not to make reply. This is not to reason why. This is but to do and die. And over here, guys, I would speak about the anaphora. And out of all of them, guys, I will talk about the idea of the verb reply when it comes to this particular quote. So now, guys, I would end by talking about um, the Volta over here. Volta here, guys, coincides with the juxtaposition that comes straight after it. And these are the three quotes that I would speak about when it comes to this poem. Now, guys, of course, for every poem, you can speak about loads more quotes. But remember, guys, I'm trying to give you all 15 poems in one video. I can't go over every single quote. Now, what are we doing with these quotes? Into the value of death, symbolism, foreshadowing, propaganda. The first point, guys, about propaganda is this. Soldiers can be compared to zombies in this poem. 
they just charge there's no thought there's no act there's no there's no there's no there's no deliberation here from the very beginning they are riding into the valley of death a valley is a very a valley is between two mountains but it's very very small it's the idea that these men are never going to come back out once they're in they are never returning and what is this valley a symbol of this valley is a symbol of death from the very beginning of the poem we learn the idea that soldiers had no choice they had to even charge to their own death and this is built upon later by the idea this is not to make reply this is not to reason why and this is but to do and die and the repetition of these um, the anaphora guys it juxtaposes this part here if everything is about them it's theirs 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 everything is about them but nothing is about them the whole war is about them they are fighting this battle but they do not answer they just do as they told they do not think they don't reason why they don't think why am i going that way they just charge what do what is their one job they are, they do as they are told and they die very very powerful quote guys but a very very sad quote um it's a lovely comparison to bayonet charge when we get there but it shows you the life of a soldier essentially be quiet and do as you're told even if you are told to die you die and this can also be linked to the idea of propaganda because how do you make someone sacrifice their life for their country propaganda you will be a hero if you die you will be remembered if you die this can be also linked then guys to kamikaze um but guys this is a very nice and lovely quote to talk about the idea of how soldiers were were detached from themselves they were simply robots who were commanded to do whatever they want and guys the last line the volta charging 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 the volta is the shift now they're beginning to die horse and hero fell why is this juxtaposition because this poem guys it doesn't hold anyone to account these men aren't dying because they're heroes these men are dying because somebody made a brutal mistake somebody messed up and sent these men to their deaths does somebody have to die like that to be a hero that is why it's juxtaposition remember the quote from london the blood that runs down palace walls this is a, this is an example of how the blood of these men is responsible on the hands of the generals and the people that let this battle take place but the whole poem talks about them as heroes it's as though it's ignoring the reality of what happened all right guys and that is the poem the charge of the light brigade next up guys oh i love this poem our brains ache this is one of the nature ones um our brains the first line is so beautiful our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nigh us speed we keep awake because the night is silent low drooping flares confuse our memory of the salient worried by silence sentries whisper curious nervous but nothing happens watching we hear the mad gusts tugging on the wire like twitching agonies of men among its brambles northward incessantly the flickering gunnery rumbles far off like a dull rumor of some other war what are we doing here the poignant misery of dawn begins to grow we only know that war lasts rain soaks and cloud sags to me dawn massing in the east her melancholy army attacks once more in ranks of shivering ranks of gray but nothing happens sudden successive flights of bullets streak the silence less deadly than the air that shudders black with snow with side long flowing flakes that flock pause and renew we watch them wandering up and down the wind's nonchalance but nothing happens pale flakes with fringing stealth come feeling for our faces we cringe in holes back on forgotten dreams and stay snow dazed deep into grassy ditches so we drow sun doze lit littered with blossoms trickling with blackbirds fusses is it that we are dying slowly our ghosts drag home glimpsing the sunk flies glows with crusted dark red jewels crickets jingle there for hours the innocent mice rejoice the house is theirs shutters and doors all closed on us the doors are closed we turn back to our dying since we believe no otherwise can kind fires burn not ever sun smile true on child or field or fruit 
For God's invincible spring, our love is made afraid. Therefore, not loath, we lie out here. Therefore, we're born, for love of God seems dying. Tonight, this frost will fasten on this mud and us, shivering many hands, puckering for his crisp. The burying party picks and shovels in shaking grasp, pours over half-known faces. All their eyes are ice, but nothing happens. All right, guys, this particular poem, what is it about? It is about a group of soldiers who are waiting for a battle to begin. But before the battle begins, nothing happens, nothing happens, but so much happens. Because while they're waiting for the battle to begin, they're fighting a war that they never planned for. And this is the war against nature. And that is the war that ultimately destroys these men. Now, how are we looking at this particular point? First things first, guys, it begins with our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us. Over here, I want to talk about personification. And then I want to talk about the sibilance. And then I want to speak about the enjoyment. So we've got structure and we've got language. Sorry, we've got form and language done straight away. And then, guys, the mad gusts tugging on the wire. Then if you want to, guys, you can use the constant repetition of nothing happens. And the last quote, guys, is this quote over here. So let's go through, guys. The mad gusts tugging on the wire. The verb tugging here is a very good verb. And then the personification here is very, very effective. Um, and then, guys, you can also speak about um, the repetition <clears throat> on these particular lines should you wish to and the ends it guys with the idea of juxtaposition now let's go over these particular lines also guys when it comes to the form guys when it comes to the form of this poem this poem guys Again, I would argue it is a narrative poem because it tells you the story of these men, the untold story of what they experience. Our brains ache in the merciless iced east winds that nive us. What a lovely start, guys. What a lovely start. First thing first, guys, it's not our head hurts, our brains ache. They've been thinking and thinking and thinking and thinking that the head isn't hurting, but the brain itself is, is, is in pain. The brain itself is struggling. Number two, you can analyze from this quote, is the idea of propaganda. They've been fed so much, they don't even know what to do anymore. They can't even think straight. Now, the third point, the head is aching. Why? The merciless, this is also personification, iced east winds that nive us. Such a lovely sibilance. S, 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 S. And for me, guys, the S sound here mimics the movement of nature. It's a long movement. S, S, S. And what's the S also mimicking? The niving. The wind is coming in, stabbing. Coming out, stabbing. Coming out, stabbing. Guys, the poem begins on line one with these men getting absolutely destroyed by nature. They're not dodging bullets or bombs nature and the point is you can't defeat nature you can't you can't defeat nature you can't beat something you can't see you can't fight the wind so it begins guys with these men absolutely helpless and guys the mad gusts tugging on the wire things just get absolutely uh, worse but why is it important that the wind the gust is mad anger you can link this to anger nature isn't happy with these people and what they're about to do war and fighting and killing and pillaging so nature is absolutely mad and is tugging on the wire even the next part here guys this is also a very good quote like twitching agonies of men on brambles that's a good simile and it's the idea guys that nature and the way the wind is blowing is just tearing these people apart um, it's just destroying everything they haven't even started the war and they are getting destroyed and that is why this 
juxtaposes, nothing happens. Why? Because it shows you that just like the men in charge of the light brigade, these men are programmed to stand there and wait for the war to begin. But they don't understand. The war has begun. Nothing happens. Mate, so much is happening. You're getting battered by nature. But just because they've been programmed to understand that you don't move and you stand there and you wait, in their head, everything is okay. And that is why we can link this to the last quote. Ultimate downfall. They're going to die out here. And they're not going to die because they've, they've been shot. They're going to die because they've been frozen to death by nature because they're still waiting for the war to begin. But the war began ages ago and that is the war with nature. The brain party guys, it won't even recognise their faces because of how they look. Then we have the poem Storm on the Island. We are prepared, we build our houses, squat, sink walls in rock and roof them with good slate. This wizened earth has never troubled us with hay. So as you see, there are no stacks or stooks that can be lost, nor are there trees which might prove company when it blows full blast. You know what I mean, leaves and branches can raise a tragic chorus in a gale, so that you can listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. But there are no trees, no natural shelter. You might think that the sea is company, exploding comfortably down the cliffs, but no, when it begins, the flung spray hits the very window, spits like a tame cat, turns savage. We just sit tight while wind dives and strafes invisibly. Space is a salvo. We are bombarded by the empty air. Strange, it is a huge nothing that we fear. All right, guys, storm on the island. Let's now go through what this particular poem is about. The poem is also quite symbolic because this poem symbolises the problems in Northern Ireland and it talks about the divide um, that existed at the time. And this poem is a reflection of that. And it talks about the idea of propaganda and how people were told to prep for a war. But in reality, this part here, it was a huge nothing that we fear. Everything they were prepping for, everything they were preparing for, it's like me preparing for an enemy that's coming through that window over there, but really they're going to come through the window over here. Their focus was incorrect. Their focus was on the wrong people. Two is a huge nothing that we fear. I want you guys to use these quotes and we'll analyse them in a second, but these quotes are worth talking about as juxtaposition. And then I would like you to also talk about this part over here, which is the volta of our poem. We just sit tight while wind dies. I would like you all to speak about this, guys, as being the volta of the poem. And for this part here, guys, you can zoom in to the verb sit. And finally, guys, when it comes to our last quote, to the thing you fear forgetting that it pummels your house too. Right, the technique here would be personification or shadowing. And when it comes to the form of this poem, this poem guys would be an epic poem because it is about the events in Northern Ireland. Now, when it comes to analysing these three quotes, guys, and analysing the entire poem, essentially, guys, the message of this poem is that you can't ever prepare for war because there are elements you don't control. Now, it begins, guys, with confidence. It begins with, we are prepared. And it ends with, it's a huge nothing that we fear. Those two contrast. They are juxtaposing. Why? Because it begins with the speaker absolutely clear as to what they're trying to fight we are prepared they know exactly who they're gonna go up against but by the end of the text it's confusion it's question mark question mark question mark question mark and that's for and that's why there is juxtaposition because throughout the poem the speaker has a realization and then guys all this part talks about how they prepared but then they realize hold on 
You listen to the thing you fear, forgetting that it pummels your house too. That point in the poem is very powerful. These people, guys, pummeling is attacking the house and it foreshadows their downfall. Why does it foreshadow their downfall? Because at this moment in the text, it realizes that as human beings, they spent so much time looking out, following the news, doing what they've been told, hate that person, forget that person, never realizing that the same people that have taught you to hate, the same people that have taught you to live a certain way, when the time is right, they will attack you as well. Nobody is safe. Nobody is safe from this attack. And then guys, it's the idea of being helpless. Nature here, guys, for me is, symbol is, is symbolic of the idea of the government. Because what can they do when the attack begins? They just sit tight. What happened to all that prep? What happened to all that um, discussion of what they've done? When the attack begins, when the war begins, if you want to make it a war of nature, when the war with nature begins, what can you do? Nothing. You just sit tight and wait to hope and pray to God that it doesn't destroy you completely. And that is why the vulture here is important. Because the vulture here shifts to the idea of them being absolutely helpless. It is a good poem, guys, to compare to um, exposure. All right, guys, next one. It's a nice poem. This is Bayonet Charge. Um, suddenly he awoke and was running raw in raw, seemed hot. His sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire. Hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air, he lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. In bewilderment then he almost stopped. In what cold clockwork, the stars and the nations, was he the hand pointing at that second? He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs, listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running, and his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. Then the shot slashed furrows, threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth open silent, its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge, king, honour, human dignity, etc., dropped like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terrors touchy dynamite. Guys, what is a bayonet? A bayonet is a rifle that has a knife attached to the end. And it, this poem, guys, essentially, in a nutshell, it's about a soldier who wakes up and he is in the middle of a battle and he runs. And as he's running, he's thinking, what am I doing here? Why am I even here? Um, and then by the end of the poem, he realizes that everything he's been sold is a lie. Everything he's been fighting for is a lie. And these are the three quotes, guys, that we're going to try to remember when it comes to this poem. It's smacking the belly out of the air. And who jumped up in the dark and runs. And number three, guys, dropped like luxuries in a yelling alone. These are the three quotes that we are going to remember. And I would argue, guys, that this particular poem is also a narrative poem because it tells the story of the realization that this man has whilst on the battlefield. Now, what are we going to analyze for these three? Bullets smacking the belly out of the air. We begin with a metaphor and I would like to talk about the use of an onomatopoeia over there. Then guys, I would talk about the simile here and I would talk about what we can discuss about what the word dark symbolizes in this part of the text. And then guys, I would look at this as being a volta and I would talk about um, how the writer uses juxtaposition at this moment in our text also. And finally guys, when it comes to this particular poem guys, you can talk about patriarchy and we can talk about propaganda should we wish to. Now what can we say about these three quotes? 
I've tried to pick these three quotes, guys, because these three quotes you can use to tell the story of the poem. The poem begins, guys, with this guy in a battle. Bullets were smacking the belly out of the air. Have you guys ever smacked your bellies? That's the sound it makes. That's what he's talking about. As he's running, he can hear bullets bang, 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 bang. And what did it show us here, guys, that first part? It shows us what an amateur he is. He's not fit to be a soldier. If you're a soldier and you're running and you can hear bullets bang, 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 Take cover, take your gun out. You got a bayonet, use it. But it shows how he as a soldier is not trained. He's just been sent to the army and go and fight for your particular country. And then guys, that idea is built upon here. He was running like a man who jumped up in the dark and runs. He has no clue what he's doing. And that's why the word dark can symbolize darkness as in it's dark, but dark is the idea his eyes are blinded. He can't see the truth. He can't see why he's here. That again, guys, is another good quote to talk about the idea of how these soldiers had no power, yet they were in positions of power. And the last quote, guys, I love this quote. King, honor, human dignity. These were the three things that he was told you fight for. You fight for your king. You fight for the honor of your country and you fight for the people and the respect of the people of your country. Then, the fourth on the list, etc. It, it, it's, like it's like a disrespect. And blah, 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 and blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Everything he's been told to fight for dropped like luxuries in an alarm. When an alarm goes off, you run. You drop everything and you run. At that moment in time, all the lies, everything that he'd been fed, he dropped it. He opened his eyes. His shackles were off. He was free. And that is why that last part is the vulture. Because this is when the man actually wakes up. This is the process. And then he wakes up and he says, damn, I'm going to drop all of this. And therefore, this, this juxtaposes a soldier. This poem is a good poem to compare to the poem Charge of the Light Brigade. Because it's the opposite. It's the opposite of that particular poem. All right, guys, let's move on. Next poem, guys, that we're going to do is the poem remains. On another occasion, we get sent out to, tell, to tackle looters raiding a bank and one of them legs it up the road. Probably armed, possibly not. Well, myself and somebody else and somebody else are all of the same mind. So all three of us open fire. Three of a kind, all letting fly. And I swear, I see every round as it rips through his life. I see broad daylight on the other side. So we've hit this looter a dozen times and he's day on the ground, sort of inside out. Pain itself, the image of agony. One of my mates goes by and tosses his guts back into his body. Then he's carted off in the back of a lorry. End of story, except not really. His blood shadow stays in the street and out on patrol, I walk right over it week after week. And then I'm home on leave, but I blink. And he's there, sorry, and he bursts again through the doors of the bank. Sleep and he's possibly armed, possibly not. Dream and he's torn apart by a dozen rounds. And the drink and the drugs won't flush him out. He's here in my head when I close my eyes, dug in behind enemy lines, not left for dead in some distant sun stunned sand smothered land or six feet under in desert sand, but near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. That is the poem Remains. Now, what is this particular poem about? Guys, Remains is about the idea of regret. The idea of doing something as a soldier, but then realizing maybe it wasn't a good thing to do. This poem is in two halves. In the first half of the poem, guys, our soldier talks about how, and this poem, guys, is believed to be set in either Iraq or Afghanistan. And it talks about how this soldier was on duty and some people, they looted a bank. And as they ran away, these soldiers, they blasted this man from behind. And he fell and his guts were out and they disrespected his body and they put him in the back of a lorry and off he went. They brutally killed this man for pretty much nothing because he was running away. He wasn't firing back. Then, while the soldier was on duty, he was fine. But then he went home, back to where he came from, probably America. And when he went home, PTSD kicked in, trauma kicked in. Every time he slept, Every time he closed his eyes, he kept picturing this man. 
he kept picturing what was going on and then this man couldn't get over what had what he had done this is a good comparison to make guys straight off the bat to a poem like prelude because that poem is literally in the same structure two halves good to the bad now what are three quotes guys that we can use from this quote from this poem and take them straight into our exam as it ripped through his life hit this looter a dozen times any one of those or both of those if you can remember them are very good And then guys where it says, I would do dream, sleep, and blink. Guys, I would do dream, sleep, and blink. And my last quote guys that I would do, near to the knuckle, here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. Now what are we gonna talk about firstly guys, when it comes to this particular poem? When it comes to the form of this poem, straight away guys, very easily, it is a narrative poem because it tells the story of this particular man and his actions. Then, when it comes to the actual quote that we've selected, um, over here guys, and over here, I see every round as it rips through his life. Here guys, it begins with a hyperbole. And then here, it juxtaposes the entire quote. I'll explain why in a second. I blink, I sleep, and I dream. Here guys, we have a semantic field. And with these quotes, I will talk about also the Volta. And then lastly guys, near to the knuckle here and now, his bloody life in my bloody hands. I would end it by talking with the idea of a cyclical structure and then I would talk about the repetition of bloody. Now, what are we doing with these three quotes? I see every round as it rips through his life. Guys, that is a violent, violent, death violent they didn't shoot him in the leg remember he, he was running the other way they didn't shoot him in the leg they didn't just tap him to disarm him or to drop him they shot him to kill the rounds were ripping i think there's a part of there that says they saw broad daylight on the other side you can literally see right through him and it shows you the viciousness with which these soldiers killed this man i compared it to them hunting an animal it's like they were hunting an animal. That's the prey and they were the hunters. And then guys, the entire scene is juxtaposed. Juxtaposed like what? We've hit this looter a dozen times. Oh yeah, by the way, we hit him a dozen times. They don't even care. They didn't shoot him once, twice, three times, four times, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. They continuously shot this guy. It was like target practice. Bang, 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 bang. And these two quotes, guys, Number one, it shows how vicious they are, but it juxtaposes human nature. They are not behaving like human beings. They are behaving like men hunting an animal. Vicious, absolute predators. And that is what you want to say when it comes to this particular quote. And then guys, blink, sleep, and dream. I just use these three words, guys. Blink, sleep, and dream. And these three words, for me, they create a semantic field. And the semantic field is the idea of peace. When you blink and you sleep and you dream, that is when you are at peace, guys. That is when you can rest. But imagine if you couldn't sleep anymore. You'd go crazy. You'd go insane. And that is why, guys, this semantic field, it shows you how this man, he's not physically affected. It's the mind that's been affected. And that's the Volta. Where's his, where's his lackadaisical attitude? Where's his relaxed style now? Where's his, where's his predator and hunting mindset now? Now the guy can't go sleep. Now he can't relax. And that's the volta. That's the turning point of everything inside the poem. And then guys, the poem ends with this man behaving like Lady Macbeth. PTSD is our context, by the way. Guys, PTSD is our context for this poem. 
His hands are a symbol of his, cry, his crimes. He's near to the knuckle, here and now. His bloody life in my bloody hands. And the beginning, in the beginning, he was near to the knuckle. In the beginning, he had blood on his hands. But it wasn't the same effect. He was loving it then. But now, guys, it's the idea that this crime cannot be washed. This crime cannot go because the mind cannot get over it. The mind is polluted. It's inner conflict. There are so many poems that discuss inner conflict. And then guys, bloody and bloody emphasizes the idea of how the killing is still fresh in his mind. Three days before Armistice Sunday and poppies had already been placed on individual war graves. Before you left, I pinned one onto your lapel. Crimped, crimped petals, spasms on paper red, disrupting a blockade of yellow bias binding around your blazer. Sellotape bandage around my hand, I rounded up as many white cat hairs as I could. Smooth down your shirt's upturned collar, steal the softening of my face. I wanted to graze my nose across the tip of your nose, play at being Eskimos ex ex like we did when you were little. I resisted the impulse from my fingers to the gel black thorns of your hair. All my words flattened, rolled, turned into felt. Slowly melting, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. Threw it open, the world overflowing like a treasure chest. A split second and you were away, intoxicated. After you'd gone, I went into your bedroom, released a songbird from his cage. Later, a single dove flew from the pear tree, and this is where it has led me. Skirting the churchyard walls, my stomach busy, making tucks and darts, pleats, hatless, without a winter coat or reinforcements of scarf and gloves. On reaching the top of the hill, I traced the inscriptions on the war memorial, leaned against it like a wishbone. The dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. I listened, hoping to hear your playground voice catching on the wind. A very, very sad poem, guys. This is a very sad poem. Essentially, guys, this poem is about a mother who is remembering her fallen son um, who died, we presume, in war. And the mother, poppies, is a symbol of uh, remembering war. And the mother is remembering the son that she once had. Now, this particular poem, guys, I would argue that this is an epic poem. And the reason I would argue, guys, because it is the event of remembrance um, that this poem is centered around. Now, when it comes to three quotes um, that I would use um, for this particular poem, I would use the idea of sellotape bandage around my hand. Actually, no, let's do a better one. I want to graze my nose across the tip of your nose. Then guys, I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. And then the dove pulled freely against the sky, an ornamental stitch. These are the three quotes um, that I would use when it comes to this particular poem. And of course you can learn more, but these three quotes guys are very good quotes. I want you to graze my nose across the tip of your nose. Our poem with symbolism. And I would zoom in to the verb of grace. Then I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. I would talk about the structural technique of flashback. And I would talk about the adjective brave. And then guys, this for me here is the Volta. And I would zoom in. To the verb pull. Now, what are we doing with these quotes? What are we doing with these quotes? Guys, you know, this poem, it focuses on the dark side of war. The really, really dark side of war, though. The other poems, right, never focused on the victims of war other than soldiers. Bayonet Charge was about the soldier. Charge of the Light Brigade was about the soldier. Exposure was about the soldier, but this poem is about the other victims, the family, the friends, the people that are left behind when all the dust has settled. These people, all they've got left is memories 
all they've got left is bits in their mind that they're praying to God that they don't forget. That's the mother in this poem. It begins, guys, I want you to graze my nose against the tip of your nose. Very, very symbolic action. Playful. And it's similar in love, guys. The, the, the image of the mother and a child and their nose is grazing. It, it is a very, very iconic image. And at this point, guys, it symbolizes what she once had. She's living in that moment. She's living in that past. Her son's grown up. This big guy who's been going to war, he's still a kid. But the mother wants that moment. She, for him, this is still her child. And therefore, guys, this quote here, it shows the innocence of war. You could put a uniform on a man and give him a gun. But that's still her boy. That's still her son. Take it all away. She wants that boy back. War has ruined her life. Then, guys, she didn't... It shows the idea, guys, I was brave. Every other point, bravery is associated with who? Bravery is associated with the soldiers themselves. But I was brave here, guys, is the idea that this is a war for the mother. This is a fight for the mother. She has to be brave herself. I was brave as I walked with you to the front door. I will talk about the flashback here, guys, and I will talk about the adjective here of how she has to behave in this situation. And then this is the vulture, guys. And this is the vulture because at this moment, the mother is almost having to let go. The mother, guys, is almost having to let go. The dove that's pulling, in the, the dove that's pulling, I would argue, um, is a, it, it, it is symbolism, but it's the idea that it's pulling, that the dove is a symbol of her son and it's pulling away. It's time for the mum to let go. It's time for the mum to set her son free. That is how I view these last line, the point. It's that Volta guy, it's the, it's, the, it's the mother forcing herself to let go of the sadness and the sorrow that she's held on to for so long. But this poem, guys, is very, very good to talk about the victims of the victims. The first victim were the soldiers, but the victims after the victims were the friends and the family. And in this case, the mother of that child. All right, guys, the next poem that we are looking at is Wolf Dogfer. In his dark room, he is finally alone. The spools of suffering set out in all his rows. The only light is red and softly glows. As though this were a church and he a priest preparing to atone a mass. Belfast, Beirut, from Penn. All flesh is grass. He has a job to do. Solutions slop in trays beneath his hand. Do not tremble then, though seem to now. Rural England, how home again to ordinary pain with simple weather can dispel to fields which don't explode beneath the feet of running children in a nightmare heat. Something is happening. A stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes. A half-formed ghost. He remembers the cries of this man's wife having sought approval without words to do or someone must and how the blood stains into foreign dust. A hundred agonies in black and white from which his editor will pick out five or six for Sunday supplement. The reader's eyeballs prick with tears between the bath and the pre-lunch beers. From the aeroplane, he stares impassively at where he earns his living and they do not care. Guys, this poem is similar to Poppy's in the sense that it is about the victims of the victims of war. Who is the war photographer? The war photographer, his job is essentially to take pictures of war. And this guy, that's his job. So he's gone out there and he's been snapping away. He's been taking loads of pictures and he comes back home. And when he comes back home, similar to the guy in exposure, when they come back home, when they're out of that environment, he begins to suffer from PTSD. He begins to have some mental discussions and some mental torture. And the poem begins, guys, <coughs> where he's looking at the pictures. And then in paragraph two, in par sorry, in stanza two and stanza three, the pictures almost come alive and they begin to trouble him. They begin to haunt him and they begin to really cause him discomfort. And by the time guy in stanza four, he's bitter, he's upset, but back out he goes because he has a job to do. It comes to this poem, guys. This poem is our easy peasy narrative poem because it tells the story of the war photographer. And th again, guys, the first line of the, the, the quotes, guys, that I would use, guys, is his hands which did not 
uh, tremble they'll seem to now second quote that i would use guys a stranger's features faintly start to twist before his eyes and the last one that i would use guys is a hundred agonies in black and white now what are we saying about these quotes number one the first technique that i would like to talk about in this poem is juxtaposition and the part about structure that i would like to talk about is the idea of enjoyment that is when it comes to these two quotes zoom in to the verb of twist and then link it to foreshadowing and then if you wanted to link this point your context here would be ptsd and then we have our final quote guys a hundred agonies in black and white this is a metaphor and i would focus on what a hundred symbolizes and that is what i would discuss today now what are we saying about these three it's a narrative point but what are we saying about these three the first one guys is um his hands which do not tremble does seem to now i should have said it earlier guys i also really really like the verb tremble in this instance now what can we do here guys the fact that his hands are trembling but they're not shaking they're trembling trembling normally is an involuntary act this is shaking right my hand's shaking right now but when you tremble trembling is linked to emotion trembling is linked to feelings and the feeling that can be displayed here guys is the idea of fear is the idea of um, nerves is the idea of ptsd but this guy is now struggling with what he's done these pictures that he once took he's now struggling with the memories that these pictures are bringing back and therefore guys in this one line from there to there we've got juxtaposition because this contrasts that from no hands trembling to hands trembling this man shows a change has occurred and you want to talk about the idea that the change in setting mimics the change in his feelings and then guys why are we talking about enjoyment one two three all these lines are enjoyment but what do you want what do we want to say here guys i will talk about the idea of how there's two things that the enjoyment mimics it's the never ending memory that is always coming in and then the uncontrollable actions there's no order because if there's a comma or a full stop at the end of a line there's a clear order and a clear structure because there's no clear order because there's no clear structure this mimics his behavior this mimics his movements that's the first quote done next one guys a stranger's features strangers are haunting him <laughs> he doesn't know who these dead bodies are he doesn't know who these people he was saying excuse me excuse me uh, wife let me take a picture of your husband before you start crying because that's what he talks about over here about how he used to ask people's approval to take snapshots while they were mourning the death of loved ones but the strangest features guys what did they foreshadow it foreshadows eventual downfall because he's now hallucinating he's seeing things from hands trembling he's now seeing things what does this link to it links to the poem remains blinking sleeping dreaming it's a gradual build up um and the, the the features start to twist before his eyes now why is that verb important guys the verb is important because it's not as though like right now right if i said to you guys i'm picturing i'm picturing i don't know a car that's fine but this man he's not picturing his victims they're moving and they're twisting it's like a ghost in front of him it's like he's being haunted um by these memories um of what he did again ptsd and then guys the last stanza where he talks about 100 agonies in black and white what are these agonies what are these things that he's saying they literally the symbol of pain the symbol of hardship is the pictures and that is why that is symbolism um that has been used in that quote now guys one extra quote not quote but one thing to talk about is the idea of resentment over here he's saying look i'm going through all of this i went through all of this and the editor will pick out five or six for the sunday supplement what does that imply his hardship 
is entertainment. It's going to sell copies. It's going to sell papers. As human beings, we've become desensitized to warfare. When I'm on my phone and I'm swiping through my Instagram feed and I see a war or violence, I carry on swiping because we've seen it so much. For these people, his hardship, his war, the stuff that he goes through is entertainment for other people. And therefore, guys, it shows you the juxtaposition, the paradox when it comes to warfare. You've got soldiers dying. You've got this man struggling because of the pictures that he takes of these men dying. And then you've got the last part of the, of the conveyor belt. You've got people buying articles, buying papers, enjoying these uh, articles because of the pictures that are used. This poem, guys, it shows you the other side of war um, that some of these poems talk about. Oh, God, here we go. Tissue, guys, tissue, tissue. I promise you guys, tissue is not hard. I'm going to make it super duper easy for you guys. Tissue, guys. Paper that lets the light shine through. This is what could alter things. Paper thin by age or touching. Uh, where am I? The kind you find in well-used books. The kind you find in well-used books. Where am I, guys? The back of the Quran where a hand has written the names and history. Who was born to whom. The height and weight. Who died, where and how. On which sepia date. Page is smooth and stroked and turned. Transparent with attention. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift. See how easily they fall away on a side, a shift in the direction of the wind. Maps to the sun shines through their borderline, the marks that rivers make. Roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, find slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold. And what was paid by credit card might fly alive like paper kites or block. But let the daylight break through capitals and monoliths, through the shapes that pride can make. Find a way to trace a grand design. With living tissue, raise a structure never meant to last. Of paper smoothed and stroked and thin to be transparent, turned into your skin. Tissue, 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 guys. What is this poem about? This is my analysis, guys, of this poem. For me, guys, tissue at the top. Um, guys, tissue at the top over here is a metaphor. And it's a metaphor for life. And this poem, it doesn't talk about tissues that you wipe your bum with. It talks about tissue in the sense of us human beings. Human beings are built of tissue. You cut me and you remove my skin. I'm not a scientist, but sooner or later, you're going to bump into my tissue. And it's the idea of the creation of life. And that is why the last line is the build-up of all of this turning into our skin, turning into us. So this poem, guys, is the metaphor or is a metaphor for life on how to create or how to be like the perfect person. That is how I analyze the poem. It's fine system grocery shops, my flyer lives like paper kites. That's two, the sun shines through <coughs> their borderline, living tissue raise a structure never meant to last these are the quotes that i would like us to speak about now what's being used and where is it being used over here i would talk about the Sezora. and over here guys i would talk about the symbolism of the sun but the simile over here and then I would talk about the verb over there um, in that quote there now what are we doing with these quotes why did I pick Let me zoom out a little bit guys why did I pick these particular quotes let's begin there's so much guys that we can say in this point um, there's so much if I had an hour to analyze a poem we would go into crazy detail but for the sake of this video, guys, I want to try to keep it short and keep it as beneficial as possible. Now, what can you do with this poem and these three quotes? Remember what I said earlier, this poem is a metaphor for life, how to raise and create the perfect being. Now, number one, maps two, and the Sezora gives it a pause and gives it emphasis. 
Now, what are maps a symbol of? Maps, guys, are a symbol of the world, of course. And on the map, we have borders. Yeah, we have borders. You're from England, you're from, I don't know, America, you're from Pakistan, you're from this, you're from that, you're from that. And the writer is saying that with the map, we should, we should let the sun shine through the map. Now, when you let light shine through paper, what happens? The paper is hard to see. The paper becomes blurry because the light takes out a lot of the text or the lines. And the interpretation, guys, of this quote is the writer is talking about if we want to create the perfect person, then we must stop defining ourselves through our nationalities because it causes division. It causes problems. You're from there and you're from there. You're from there and you're from there. Next, stop following man-made lines. Stop following man-made borders. Instead, use natural borders, mountains are natural. Use them instead of building your own lines and dividing the people. That's the first way to create the perfect person. Second, find clips from grocery shops. My flyer lives like paper kites. Now, what is this quote saying over here? Guys, you get a kite and you put it in the wind. And if the wind goes that way, you go that way. The wind goes that way, you go that way. What is this paragraph talking about? First, it talked about stop dividing yourself based upon where you're from. Number two, stop chasing money, Mr. Burling, Mr. Scrooge. Stop being that person whose life is based upon wealth, whose life is based upon money. And just imagine, imagine the kite is money and you're chasing it. If the wind goes that way, you go that way. If the wind goes that way, you go that way. Have some value. Stop moving wherever it goes. And then the last part, guys, is the culmination of the entire events in the poem. If you can fix all of that, and guys, there's other stuff the poet talks about. They talk about religion in the poem. They talk about society in the poem. You put all that together. You fix all those problems. What can you do? You can raise a structure with living tissue that was never meant to last. What is a structure that is raised with living tissue that is never meant to last? We are that structure. The writer is saying it's juxtaposition because all that effort into creating something that is never meant to last. But that's the idea of power. We are powerless. We are only on this earth for a set amount of time. But the writer is saying, guys, in this poem, stop doing things that make life bad for yourself and other people. Stop dividing based upon nationality. Stop uh, chasing money like it means everything to you. And other stuff he talks about, take guidance from religion. Stop following trends in society when it talks about how buildings are existing. Instead, you want to get rid of all those bad qualities and then you can raise a structure that is never meant to last, that is ultimately turned into us. All right, guys, Emma Green. And this is a poem that I hate because the lady in this poem lives in denial. The Emma Green, guys. There was once a country, I left it as a child, but my memory of it is sunlight clear. For it seems I never saw that saw it in that November, which I am told comes to the mildest city. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view. The bright filled paperweight. It may be at war, it may be sick with tyrants, but I am branded by an impression of sunlight. The white streets of that city, the graceful slopes go even clearer as time rolls its tanks and the frontiers rise between us, close like waves. That child vocabulary I carried here like a hollow doll, open and spills like a grammar. Spills a grammar. Soon I shall have every coloured molecule of it. It may be now, it may by now be a lie banned by the state, but I can't get it off my tongue. It tastes of sunlight. I have no passport. There's no way back at all. But my city comes to me in its own white plain. It lies down in front of me, docile as paper. I comb its hair and love its shining eyes. My city takes me dancing through the city of walls. They accuse me of absence. They circle me. They accuse me of being dark in their free city. My city hides behind me. They mutter death and my shadow falls as evidence of sunlight. What is the emigre about guys? The emigre is about a person, a woman, a girl who left her country as a child. And when she left her country as a child, she left it because her country was under war. It was being occupied. It was being taken over by, by oppressive bad rulers. And as time has gone on, her country has changed.
because the rule has changed and war has changed and she can't accept that. She can't accept that the place she's from has now changed. They don't want her anymore. The people there have now changed. It's been colonized and she then tries to go back but she does not belong in that place. So it's the idea guys of the effects of war, not killing, but the effects of war of people who are misplaced and people who had to leave and lose their homes and then they became strangers where once they belonged. If you wanna look at this poem guys, I would call it an epic poem because it talks about the event of war and the other impacts that warfare can have. Okay. The worst news of it cannot break my original view. That's the idea of um, that's the idea of denial. The second quote I would use guys like a hollow doll opens and spills a grammar. They accuse me of absence, they circle me. These are the three quotes that I would use. And guys, I hope you're noticing a trend. The quotes that I'm picking, the three, the three quotes that I choose can pretty much sum up every single poem that we're doing. All right, guys, first things first is the idea of denial. The worst news I receive of it cannot break my original view. She's saying that no matter what I'm told, no matter what they say about my city, no matter what they say about where I'm from, I'm not going to change. I'm going to still believe that it is perfect. And this is juxtaposition, guys, because she is in absolute denial. And the enjoyment, guys, line carrying on, for me, emphasizes how this has gone on for far too long. But it shows you the damage that war has done. Land for her was not just like uh, bricks and grass. Land for her symbolized a belonging. It symbolized somewhere she loved. It symbolized home. So even though things have changed, she's stuck on and held on to that memory of where she's gone. And then guys, the simile over here, like a hollow doll opens and spills a grandma. This is very important. A hollow doll, empty inside. And when you talk, you spill grammar. Blah, 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 blah. That's what that is. Grammar is what? Grammar is symbols and rules. It's not words. So it's the impression, guys, that I get that when she speaks now, nobody understands her. It's like listening to grammar. It doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? Where's your words? What are you saying to me? Nobody understands what she's talking about. Nobody understands what she's trying to say. Nobody's going to listen. And then, guys, finally, they, the they here is her referring to the people of that land that she once left. They accuse me of being absent, meaning you left us. This is not yours anymore. You, you ran away. You went. They circle me is foreshadowing her downfall. But I wouldn't say they're going to physically kill her. It foreshadows the downfall of her memory. And that's why it's the volta, it's the shift. It's like a wake-up call. She's realizing that her memory must die. Her memory must fall um, of the land that she once had. And guys, that is how you want to view the poem Emigree in a nutshell. Now guys, checking out my history. I am not going to read all of that because that would take us ages. But guys, checking out my history is a very good poem. Checking out my history is a poem that looks at the problems with society, the problems with the government, the problems with education. It looks at how everything that this man has been taught has been taught with an agenda. It's been taught one-sided. He accuses education of being classist, of being racist. And he talks about how everything you taught me has been there to dumb me down, has been there to blind me. You've never taught me about my history, about where I'm from. You've only taught me about things to boost up the empire, to boost up the colonial view that the world is supposed to live under. And this is what this poem is about. This man is trying to break free of his shackles. He's trying to break free of everything that he's been told. And he's trying to find his identity. He's trying to find who he is. Now, when it comes to this poem, this is our lovely, beautiful, free verse poem, guys. Because this poem, look at it. It has no clear stanza length. It follows no rules. Mr. John Agar does whatever he reflect the idea of freedom. Now, let's focus, guys. 
bandage up my eye with my own history, blind me to my own identity. That is quote number one that we shall be focusing on. The repetition of them tell me, them tell me, and it continues throughout the entire poem. I'm carving out my own identity. All right, yes, this is a free verse poem. The first thing that I would like us to focus on, guys, is the repetition of them tell me. Now, the language that has been used here is colloquial language. Guys, colloquial language is when you write the way you speak. And I would zoom in. Guys, I would zoom in to the verb tell for that particular quote. Then, for the second one, bandage up me eye with my own history, blind me to me own identity. This, I would use it as juxtaposition and I would zoom in to what a bandage symbolizes of the verb carving over here. And I would also link it to the idea of foreshadowing in this particular quote. All right, cool. What are we doing? What are we doing with these particular quotes? First things first, damn, tell me, 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 damn, tell me. Why is he writing in colloquial language? Why is he saying them tell me? Why is he saying them tell me? I would argue, guys, this is a power play. He's not following the rules of English, lang of English language. He's writing the way he speaks because the way he speaks reflects where he's from. So he is using language here as a tool of claiming back his power. That is what I would say for the colloquial language. And then guys, I will zoom into the verb tell because he's now gonna flip it. You've been telling me stuff for all this time. Now let me tell you something. So now he's flipping it and he keeps repeating it over and over again because he wants to emphasize the idea that number one, enough is enough, but number two, listen to me. If you wanna go for a third one, put a big question mark. Who is the them? The them, the D-E-M, could be a symbol of the government. It could be a symbol of education. It could be a symbol of the media. All the different arms of the government can be a symbol of the dem. Because all these ways is, all these methods, sorry, is what the government uses to pass out information, to tell people stuff. They'll use TV, they'll use, they'll use YouTube, they'll use movies, they'll use music videos, they'll use education, they'll use teachers and curriculum to pass out certain ideas. And that's maybe who he's referring to in the them. Then guys, bandage up me eye with me own history. When do you normally put a bandage over something? You put a bandage over something to cover the wounds, to cover the scars. They want to hide their crimes. They want to hide the crimes that they've committed against this man's people. They want to hide what they've done. And they also want to blind him to who he is and where he's from. And this is to gain power. Because one of the, one of the tools of colonization to gain power was to cut ties between people and their history. And this was done by changing the language of the land, changing the literature of the land. So as time went on, generation after generation would become detached to where their family were from. And then guys, finally, if we're looking at the last few lines, the last line of the poem, this line of the poem, guys, it contrasts, it juxtaposes the first couple of lines of the poem in the beginning. So you can juxtaposition as well. He is now carving. Guys, this verb is so powerful. It's like Macbeth carving out his passage. When you carve something, you leave a permanent mark. He is now finding out who he is, bit by bit, not in one go. He's carving, it's a process. It's something he's doing over time. But what is he carving? He's carving out his identity. He's finding who he is. And the poem ends by him clearly saying, I am claiming back the power that you once took from me. Very good comparison to the poem, Bay Net Charge. Now, move on to the poem, Kamikaze. Um, Mr. Suicide is what I call this poem. Um, Kamikaze, guys. Her father embarked at sunrise with a flask of water, a samurai sword in the cockpit, 
a shaven head full of powerful incantations and enough fuel for a one-way journey into history. But halfway there, she thought, recounting it later to her children, he must have looked down, he must have looked far down at the little fishing boat strung out like bunting on a green, blue, translucent sea. And beneath them, aching, arcing in swathes, uh, like a huge flag waved first one way, then the other in a figure of eight. The dark shoals of fishes flashing silver as their bellies swiveled towards the sun and remembered how he and his brothers waiting on the shore built cairns of pearly green pebbles to see whose withstood longest the turbulent inrush of breakers bringing their father's boat safe. Yes, grandfather's boat safe to the shore, salt shodden, salt sodden, awash with cloud market mackerel, black crabs, feathery prawn, the loose silver of white bait, and once a tuna, the dark prince, muscular dangerous. And though he came back, my mother never spoke again in his presence, nor did she meet his eyes and the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed. Only we children chatted and laughed till we too gradually learned to be silent. What a lovely quote. Uh, to live as though he had never returned, and this was no longer the father we loved. And sometimes, she said, he must have wondered which had been the better way to die. All right, guys, Kamikaze, what is this poem about? Guys, first things first, you must understand, guys, that Kamikaze was a suicide uh, mission. So a Kamikaze was in Japan when um, Japanese men would go into a small aeroplane and they would ride that aeroplane into a boat or into a ship of the enemy. They would blow themselves up and the enemies would die also. It was a suicide mission, essentially. And this poem, guys, it links heavily to the context of propaganda. So these men were fed so much propaganda that they were told that if they do that, they die for their country and they go down in history. So this man, he gets up in the morning and he has to go do his kamikaze mission. He essentially has to go kill himself for the sake of his country. But halfway there, basically, he looks down and he begins thinking about his family and his life and he stops and he changes his mind and he turns around and he comes back home. When he comes back home, and now this shows the power of propaganda, when he comes back home, he is disowned by everyone. His wife, his friends, his family, his kids when they grow up, they all disown him. They all never talk to him because he's seen as a traitor. He's seen as a coward because he didn't kill himself for the sake of his country. And therefore, guys, this, show, this poem shows you that this guy was probably better off dying for his country because by surviving, he was living like a dead man anyway. And that is what this poem is about. I will talk about how this poem is an epic poem because it talks about the event of what a kamikaze had to embark upon. Um, and the first quote, guys, I would use is a head full of powerful incantations. He remembered how he and his brothers waiting on the shore. That part is enough. And the last quote, guys, that I would use is the idea of till gradually we too learned to be silent. These are the three quotes that I would use. Number one, guys, <coughs> head, full, head full of powerful incantation. And then I will talk about the verb incantations for that first particular quote. And then, guys, over here, I will talk about the noun and then I will talk about the flashback. And then guys, over here, I will talk about the Volta. And I would speak about the juxtaposition. Those are three quotes and those are the things that I would analyze in these quotes. Now, what are we saying here, guys? You know what it says that his head was full of powerful incantations. Incantations are spells. Now, obviously, guys, there's no one doing juju on him. There's no magic happening here. But what is this a symbol of? What is it talking about here? It's the idea of propaganda. His head is full of spells. Why do people cast spells? People cast spells to control somebody. This is the propaganda he's referring to. His brain is full of stuff like fight for your country because you're brave. Fight for your people because that's what you're supposed to do. King, honor, human dignity, linking it what to? Bayonet charge. This poem is very similar to Bayonet charge. 
The guy starts off ready to go, but as the poem develops, he realizes, what am I doing? And he jumps ship, he abandons. And that is what we can say, guys, from the first quote that we learn that this guy is, is, is a victim of propaganda because that is what was used heavily during warfare. And then, guys, it's the flashback. What breaks? What loosens the chains? What, what, what rubs out the, the incantations? It's the memories, it's the flashbacks that he has, in particular the Noun brothers. The brothers symbolize family, they symbolize love. And you've got relationships, you've got life versus death, and that battle going on right now. Does he walk into the valley of death, or does he pull back because he remembers that, hold on a second, I'm not a robot. I have people that I care about, I have people that care about me. And there's that juxtaposition, guys, there's that fight that he has between the two of them. And then, guys, last but not least, this is the Volta, because look at the, look at the juxtaposition. After all that, who did he come back for? He came back for his family. He came back for relationships. He came back for the people. They don't care about him. To them, he's a coward. To them, he's a sellout. And that is why it's juxtaposition. And why is this the Volta, guys? Because this is a turning point where even the last people that were left were the children. And even they learned, that verb is very powerful. Even they learn based upon the status quo, based upon society, that people like that man, people like your dad, people like our dad, we don't speak to him because he's an outcast because of what he did. And that is a nice way to end the poem because it shows the danger of propaganda and the power of war. How war can brainwash people to make them obsessed with winning, that they are even willing to put their country before family and relationships. So in this video, we have now covered Ozymandias, we've covered London, Prelude, Duchess, Light Brigade, Exposure, Storm of the Island, Bayonet Charge, Remains, Poppies, War Photographer, Tissue, Emigree, Checking Out My History and Kamikaze. We have covered all 15 power and conflict poems. Nothing remains, nothing is left to be done. I genuinely hope guys, that you find this video beneficial and I hope you find some benefit in all the poem, poems. Last thing, how do you compare the poems? This is the structure that I use. P, R, T and E. P, R, T and E. And then you come back and you zoom in and you give the effect then you bounce across and you zoom in and you give the effect and then you end your paragraph by focusing and giving the link. Now what does that actually mean and what am I talking about? You're aiming to do three of these paragraphs. Now guys, Imagine in your exam, they ask you how or compare, compare how warfare is presented in, I don't know, bayonet charge to kamikaze, right? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about how war is presented in bayonet charge. And our point could be that war is presented in bayonet charge as being a product of propaganda. And the reference that we can use is the quote that goes like, what is it? King, honor, human dignity, etc. Drop like luxuries in an alarm. Here I can analyze the simile and give the effect of how the simile shows us how the propaganda in warfare was so strong that it took, it took the entire poem for this guy to wake up and realize what he's doing. Once I've done that, then I would say, why is my arrow the wrong way around? One, two, three, four. Guys, once I've given my effect, then I would do similarly, or on the other hand, so I would give my comparison, for example, similarly, in the poem Kamikaze, the man also wakes up during the poem, realizes what warfare is about during the poem. This can be seen, and I might give the quote either about the brothers or the incantations and the technique that has been used here, I could juxtaposition, I could the noun, whatever I want to do. And I give the effect about how this man ultimately needs to think about friends and family to wake up. This man thinks about the king and the honor and the country and the dignity. This man thinks about human relationships. I give the effect. 
Then I go back to my first poem and I zoom in to a quote, a, a word in the quote. So I may zoom in to the word etc. And I give the effect of the word etc. And I talk about how that word shows us how what was once important to him now isn't even important. He just wants to get rid of it. Then I bounce across. Then I bounce across. Furthermore, and then I zoom in to this poem, give the effect, and then I end it by giving the link. You're basically, guys, doing, if you look at the board, you're doing two pretzel paragraphs side by side, but you're breaking them up in between because the breaking up is what gives us the comparison. The black part is the comparison. I call it ping pong. You bounce back and forth between the poems. You want to aim for three of these in your exam. That is definitely possible, guys. You're essentially, guys, breaking two pretzels side by side. You want to make sure that across your entire essay, when it comes to our techniques and our zooming in, you do a breadth of language structure and form. And in one of the three paragraphs, you want to talk about context. This could be PTSD. This could be patriarchy. This could be the British Empire. This could be Freud. You fit that in in any one of the three paragraphs. All right, guys, I hope you found this video beneficial. I hope it really helps you on your exam or in your exam. It's been Mr. Everything English. Thank you so much for the support. Peace.